Hey, good morning, everyone. How we doing? That's great. You guys having a good summer so far? Yes, it's that good. I know it's a rainy day today, but we are enjoying it. We are in the book of Revelation. It's kind of sad. It's, we are coming to a close. This is our second last week. We are in chapter 20. Has it been good? Has it been helpful for you? Yes, good. That's glad. Of all the work we put in, I'm glad it's actually doing something for you in your life. For me, it's been a challenge to see Christ in this kind of macro lens and really the cost of discipleship, really even assessing my own life of where do my allegiances lie at sometimes. And this book has been provoking that, has been asking those hard questions and hopefully it's been doing the same for you. Today is chapter 20. It's the second last chapter. And I'm going to be honest, it is the most debated chapter in the entire book. So if you've got opinions about Revelation, please do not throw rocks at me this morning. We're going to get into some interesting theology. It's going to get spicy. Um, But let's read the first 10 verses and see where that takes us. All right. Chapter 20, verse 1. It says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those who, to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on the forehead or the hands. They came, they came to life and reigned with Christ for those thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until those thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophets were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. All right, we got some intense imagery in this passage, but there is this consistent theme of a thousand years. This chapter alone frames out one of the most debated theologies around this thousand years that they call the millennial reign. And as we've kind of trucked along through this book, we picked up a couple things along the way, some clues that kind of frame out what this thousand years is and some of the things that are added on some of the beginning parts of those thousand years, some of the end parts of those thousand years, and the best scholars over centuries have tried to interpret a passage like this and framed out how we are supposed to believe about the end times, about the things to come. And they've taken all those puzzle pieces and formed them in different ways. And the three most prominent views, three most prominent interpretations of all throughout history are these specific three here. Premillennialism, postmillennialism, amillennialism. All right, it's going to feel like a little class for a little bit. Bear with me. For those who like class, take notes. For those who don't, have a snooze. That's okay. We forgive you. Uh, there's this first idea of premillennialism. Pre obviously being before, millennialism being the thousand years. The, the question they're trying to answer in all these views is when exactly is Jesus returning? And so a premillennialist would see Jesus' life, death, and resurrection here. There is a time, there is where the church has, you know, on mission, but there is a point where tribulation will happen. Premillennialists think the world is progressively just going to get worse. Who's with me? No, don't raise your hands. 
they think the world is, you know, they're looking at politics, they're looking at the economy, this thing is going into the bucket. And so they think there is a point, even an intense season, just before the second coming, where things get so intense, where we saw some of those notes of the beast being unleashed out of the water to kind of torment the church. It's like, that's what they call the tribulation. Those are a couple years. And they're the kind of the longing for Jesus to return. At some point, Jesus comes back and he puts the devil in his place. He, he pins him, he puts him in prison. He actually resurrects the martyrs who have died during the tribulation and they rule for a literal thousand years. Premillennialists have a very literal and chronological interpretation of Revelation 19 to 20. They see it a literal thousand year mark. After those thousand years to the second, then the devil is released for a time to try his best to take over the world again. He is then thrown into lake of sulfur. Last judgment happens. We see this great throne scene in our text, which we'll get into. And everyone comes back to life to be judged. And then that ushers in the new heaven and earth. All right, it's wordy. So that's premillennialism. There's kind of a subversion of this, something you maybe have heard before in the past or growing up called dispensationalism. So dispensationalism looks at kind of from a macro lens, looks at all of biblical history and sees it, categorizes it in ages or dispensations. And they see this kind of compounding effect all throughout history. And how it relates to our conversation today is a, a dispensationalist would view premillennialism, but they would have a little caveat. They would have a moment here where Jesus comes back here and the rapture, that's where we get that rapture language. He actually pulls all those who believe, his people, up in the cloud. They get to dodge the whole tribulation and they get to come back here for this thousand year reign. That's nice. We like this spatialist view. It's a little softer. Now, that's premillennialism. For those who think things are going into the toilet, Postmillennialism is for those who are more optimistic about life and the future and where things are going. They think things will progressively get better over time. They don't take the thousand years as literal. It's more about a season, an epoch, a time where the church revs up, where the gospel just has a profound historic impact, where people hear it and respond to it. People, there's less resistance. The gospel is being spread all around the world, so much so that literally what one author says, postmillennialism expects that eventually the vast majority of men and women living will be saved. It's almost a sense of this thousand years, figuratively, is rolling out the red carpet for Jesus to return to this utopia. So the church has the power to reign in all this beautiful time where Jesus finally comes back. And it's in that one moment when Jesus comes back that he actually takes the beast puts him in the sulfur lake and has last judgment on his throne. So things are revving up and things are getting better for those who are post millennials. Things are getting worse for pre. Why does this matter? Great question. <laughs> it matters how we view the future, believe it or not. How you view the future informs everything you do subtly or more actively. If you were to sell a house, let's say you sold your house, you would want to know the buyer's intent. Because if the buyer was planning to tear down your house, he didn't like it, he didn't care about it, and he was going to build a new building on it, it doesn't really matter how well you take care of the building. It doesn't matter if the tiles don't match, it doesn't matter if the paint is ugly and outdated, it doesn't matter if you need to caulk the trim properly, it doesn't matter how you treat the place, because at the end, the whole thing's going to be torn down anyways. Now, if you knew the buyer was going to actually live in that home and wanted to actually make it their home, you would do everything to get the furniture right, to paint it, make it look more modern, update, because you care about them returning and taking care of that house. In the same way, how the church views the future informs our mission. And you being a part of the church, the makeup of the church, that informs what your personal purpose is in your life. And that informs what your daily rhythms actually look like. For example, if you're post, if you're pre millennialist you probably don't recycle. And if you're post, you, you definitely, you think you're ushering in Jesus coming back by recycling, put in the three, the compost, and then take out the sticker and put it in the garbage and recycling. It's like, you think that's going to bring in Jesus. All right. So it actually informs how you live your life. Now, there's this third view. A millennialism. A is a Greek word or a Greek letter that usually negates the word that it's attached to. So A being there isn't literally a millennial reign. 
amillennialism looks at the whole chapter 20 and says it's kind of a figurative language. It's symbolic. It's not a literal thousand years. Jesus began that thousand year reign in a sense at the cross, at the incarnation. When he came and said the kingdom is at hand, that is what he's talking about. When he built his church, that is what it means that we rule and reign now. When he bound the devil, it was in the wilderness that when he avoided and resisted all the temptation and actually overcame the temptation, he bound and was able to deliver demons. That is what it's talking about now. In a sense, we live in that thousand years currently right now as the church. All of these views are different. And if you subscribe to any of these views, that's okay. It's, they're secondary. They're not primary. You're not a Christian or not a Christian. If you view one over the other, great scholars and Christians have viewed all of them. They're all important. They're all valid. No one is going to be like when the clouds literally split and Jesus returns, no one's going to be like, oh man, he's doing it the post-millennial way. Like, oh, I'm a pre-guy. This is embarrassing. Like, no one's going to be thinking that. Everyone's going to be like, he's here. That's what matters. The road he took to get here is secondary. The fact that Jesus will return. That's the exciting news of Revelation. He is coming back and establishing his kingdom forever. And that's what we believe. Now, all these are respectable views, and you can have any of them. But if I'm going to be honest, there is one that kind of pokes his head up amongst the rest. If we are going to look at the whole gauntlet of how we've been interpreting this book so far and being consistent with what we call the genre of prophetic apocalyptic genre, which means there's kind of rules of how you view Revelation, to be the most consistent with that, there's one that kind of emerges. Don't throw rocks at me <laughs> on the rest. A millennialism if we're consistent with how we've been looking at the rest of this book, seeing the beast, seeing the dragon as something more of a symbol to something deeper and more profound of what Jesus is trying to communicate to us. In the same sense, this thousand years may not be a literal time. 10, the number 10 is talking about completeness. That is a number that the audience would have understood. 10 times 10 times 10. It's really, really complete. So it's less about a literal time in history, it's more about God conveying, as one author would say, that he is, it's under his sovereign control. That he reigns here and now, not one day. Sometimes we just see it as in the future someday, but this has an effect today. So if we were to look at this, let's play around with this idea. If we were to actually look through the filter of amillennialism, how would that have any impact on our life today? What would that mean for us? Well, first of all, I think the most important thing that we need to remember, it means that what you wield in your hands, the gospel, is way more of a force than you think. Like what it says in verse 2, and he sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. John is trying to communicate to us that through the death, the, the life, and the resurrection of Jesus, through the ministry of Jesus, that Satan was bound. It's what Mark echoes. When Jesus comes out of the wilderness after being tempted for, by the devil, he starts proclaiming in Mark 1, 14, he proclaims the gospel of God. That evangelion, that word gospel, is a political and secular word. It pretty much means I won a victory over there and I'm communicating it to the towns in the area of the immediate impact it has from that victory. Jesus walks out of the wilderness victorious and speaks the gospel to the towns nearby. And all throughout history, people genuinely believe this. Like you look at St. Patrick, a familiar face in history. Patrick, not only 300 years ago after this letter was written, Patrick was 16 years old when he got captured, kidnapped, and brought into what was now Ireland today. Ireland, he was captured to be a, a, sh a shepherd in the mountains where he had to embrace the cold, the wet. He was alone for months on end. He was this slave. And he was in Ireland, which was one of the worst places in history, he was steeped in demonic culture, Celtic superstition, taboos to ward off spirits, charms, totems that kept changing and changing. What Thomas Keller says, the most frightening worldview any culture has ever seen. That's what Patrick jumped into. And Patrick actually escapes. A couple of years of being a slave, he finds a small boat and goes back to his home. At home, he gets radically saved. 
And after he gets saved, what God calls him to is crazy. God calls him to go back to his nightmare. He calls him to go back to the devil's house. And Patrick obeys. Some of you struggle to forgive your aunt who, like, said something about you at Thanksgiving last year. Patrick literally goes back to his nightmare to win over his oppressors. And here's the wild thing about the devil being bound in the work of the gospel is within 30 years, almost all of Ireland became gospelized. Christian culture steeped all across the four corners of Ireland and monastic movement blew up over only 30 years. There's this Christian reform in this entire nation. Gosh, it's centuries, centuries of the devil's work steeped in that nation. The culture, the arts, the economy, the politics is undone with one faithful man wielding the gospel over a couple years. And you and I, we look at the news we look at politics, we look at world affairs, and we're paralyzed, thinking of Babylon, how powerful is forgetting what we wield in our hands. Do we live in Babylon? Absolutely. But let's not give it too much credit. When I was in high school, uh, I was all about band. I was a band guy. Uh, any band geeks in the crowd? Yeah, just me. Cool. All right. Well, this is, this is awkward. You look at me and you're like, yeah, that tracks. That makes sense. <laughs> also, saxophone was my thing, uh, and I loved it. I didn't really practice at all because the only reason I was in band, because for whatever reason, we went on trips all over the world. We went to Whistler every year. We went to Europe. I had no idea what Europe had to do with band, but I was all about that. We went to, like, Italy, Germany, Austria. And in Italy, we actually got to go to Venice. And if you've been to Venice, beautiful city. Cathedrals, art, culture, it's loaded. You're just in awe of what is going on. But it's also, you know, that it's sinking. There's, there's sidewalks, actually graded metal, that are bridges because the actual previous sidewalk is now underwater. It's interesting. Venice, 120 years. That's their prediction. In 120 years, the entire city will be underwater. And the best engineers, the best experts that are getting together are all concluding the same thing. There is nothing we can do about it. This city is going to drown. All that culture, all that ambience, all that awe of what man has built will be underwater in no time. It's interesting because everyone knows it. It's what they call the damnation of Venice. Everyone in the city knows it. Residents are leaving by the droves. No one's investing financially in that city. Businesses are closing down. Everyone is evacuating, knowing the city is sinking in all just over a century. And what the city does to kind of give you this vibe of that is full, it's exciting, that there's it's a place still to visit. Anytime a business or a residence leaves, that gap is filled with tourism. And so it, there's kiosks everywhere, there's hustle and bustle. This city has the facade of life as a facade of hustle and bustle, life, busyness, it's active, there's people everywhere. But what actually is true is the city is dead. That is Babylon now. And the crazy part is that most people don't know the city is sinking. And what you and I have in our hands, in our hearts, in our stories, is for many the only way they're going to leave the city. The gospel is not a set of ideas. It is life. It is salvation for those who need it. What would it look like if we were that kind of church? Like we were that kind of church that we remembered, not fear of everything that is going on in the world, but remembered what we had in our hands and actually used it. There, we're doing a whole bunch of baptisms in a couple of weeks. It's exciting. Dozens of people across all our sites are getting baptized. The people are recognizing their need for Jesus. They're transformed. The gospel has an impact in their life, and they want the world to know. And it's so fun. It's just exciting to be around. We do it out here in the lobby sometimes. We do it at the sites. Calgary does it in a little pool in the middle of like a cineplex theater. It's amazing. I love the mission of this church. But you've got to ask the question in the midst of celebrating and watching all of this unfold, how many of those people getting baptized is because of what you used in your hands? The story you shared about what God has done in your life. The gospel you have told to those who don't know it. Or how many of you are just watching what other people have used in their hands and celebrating God's transformative work. 
What would it look like if everyone in this room, everyone in this church remembered what was in their hands, the gospel that they wield? Now, there's a second piece that comes out of amillennialism, I think. And it seems obvious at first, but I don't think we always believe it, is that Jesus victoriously reigns here and now, not someday. It's not this future reign. It is here in the midst of us. Look at this loaded section of the passage we read. And chapter 20, verse 9. And when the thousand years are, are ended, Satan will be released from this prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea and they marched up in the broad plain of the earth and they surrounded the camp of the beloved city. You know, chapter 19 says the same story from a different angle. It says, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered to make war against who are sitting on the horse and against his armies. Two war texts, these passages that kind of give us a different angle of what we can anticipate. This great battle, the devil is rallying his troops and what you would expect is Jesus then to rally his troops. This great final battle in Revelation to come out building the anticipation, the climax of the whole thing. It's like the movie The Grey. Have you guys seen The Grey? Liam Neeson is the best and worst movie ever. It's, it's perfect Liam Neeson. It's, he's a survivalist up in Alaska, and he's with his buddies, and his plane crashes in the, like, the wilderness of Alaska. He has to survive with them. They're trying to eat. They're trying to survive the cold and find shelter. And there's actually this wolf pack that is now stalking them. And at some point, he actually, some of the wolves take out some of the other men and it, everyone kind of dies off. And it comes down to Liam Neeson and this alpha wolf, this gray wolf, this massive thing that you've been waiting this whole movie for this thing to finally go down. And it's this moment where they finally see each other and, and Liam Neeson's undone. He doesn't care anymore. He doesn't even know he's going to survive. He's like, I just got to kill this thing. And you're just like, yes, let's go. And he, he actually takes some Mickeys, like some rum and vodka things. And he smashes them and makes like brass knuckles. And you're like, this is amazing. And they're about to charge each other and the movie's over. It's awful. Awful, the most anticlimactic movie. And in some sense, this is how our story unravels. When Jesus, you anticipate this great battle to emerge, no battle. After these texts, what we see, rain, fire, and throws him in the lake, no contest. Because what Jesus accomplished, went to war over on the cross was a decisive victory 2,000 years ago. He's just showing up to cash the check. Like so much so, like the, the, we just read it. Verse one of our entire chapter. Who is the one that takes the devil, the strong man, this powerful entity, and is able to actually pin him down, chain him up, and seal him in prison? Who has that level of strength? You expect God, Jesus, you know, God sends an angel. Like this isn't a war, this is house cleaning. When he says it is finished on the cross, this is the implication. This is what he is talking about. He reigns now, not someday. And so what is the implications of that? What does that have to do with my marriage, my life, the things I'm working through, my finances? Because it's almost harder, if we're honest, to believe and to trust that he is reigning now than someday. Because the future, whether we like it or not, we have no control over it's easy to give God something and to trust him with we have no control over. You, you're going to have all eternity for me in heaven? I can believe that. I can trust you with that. You want to speak into my dating relationship now? I don't know. We struggle to expect him to reign in our lives here and now. And that is the call. While we reside in the sinking city of Babylon, while we are here in this midst, the call is to trust the one who has promised things to us, that here and now, that he is in the position to actually follow through with those promises. Like when you, your marriage after like 15 years is just dissolved abruptly, your husband, your wife is just left with very little notice. There's just information that went out about unfaithfulness and you were left there in your big room and your big house that you've built together alone, questioning all things. In that moment, Jesus still promises you that he will never leave you, that he'll never forsake you. 
If you are in your car in the driveway and you just went to the casino and you feel like, I just got this addiction that I cannot break. I find myself gambling. I went back to the place. I lied to my wife about I was at work and I lost money that we desperately need. And you're just sitting there trying to figure out how you can explain this to your wife in your driveway. And you're sitting with the guilt and the weight and you're feeling like a failure and you feel like you'll never break this cycle. You feel like, I don't even know if I'm a Christian. I don't even know what the point of this is is you, in that moment, he still promises you, he who began a good work in you will carry it to completion. When you're sitting there, maybe with your father and mother who is on their last breath, maybe riddled with cancer, you're holding their hands and you're, you're recognizing this is the time to say goodbye and there's this gut reaction, there's this gut feeling of like doubt, of like I don't even know where they'll be, I don't know where they're going to go, is, is God going to actually take care of them? On the other side of the veil, we can cling to promises like Philippians 3. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await the Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. We cling to these, trauma, these promises. If he was able to pummel the devil into submission, he can fulfill his promises as you traverse Babylon. He can carry you through this life. You can trust his reign now, not someday. Now, there are sections of this that actually speak to the future. It's not just now. If we carry on into verse 11, we get this depiction of something down the road. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. And from his, uh, from his presence, earth and the sky fled away and there's no place was found for them. And I, I saw the, de, the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up, and the dead who were in it, death and Hades, gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The crux of our passage today, the climax of our story is that everyone who has walked this earth through all of history since it has been molded and formed is resurrected. Everyone and all of creation in a sense Heaven and earth kind of dissolve to the background. The only thing that is true and real in reality is the center of all things is this throne room. The picture it displays for us is that there's nowhere for anyone, great and small, to hide from God. And then there's these two types of books that get mentioned. Verse 12, it says, The books were opened, written in the books, according to what they had done. What Daryl Johnson says, everything is there. Nothing is forgotten. The court has all the evidence it needs. It's all there. The public deeds, private deeds, public attitudes, private attitudes. Books were open. It's all there, good and bad. Even Jesus himself mentions this. Nothing in Luke 12, 2 to 3, nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. I wonder if you believe that. I wonder if you actually believe that. Maybe you do cognitively, but if we were to throw up everything, all your DMs, your texts, your emails, everything on this board, we were able to kind of flip, scroll through them, what would they say about you? Maybe it'd be embarrassing. Maybe a scheduled colonoscopy appointment maybe in there, or like, maybe there's that girl who you like, you've tried to ask out multiple times, and it's like, yeah, still ghosting you. Yeah, still nothing there. It's not responding. To everything. Maybe there's like an overdue parking ticket or something that you haven't paid yet. We're all entitled to some privacy for sure. It'd be embarrassing, but the question is, would you be ashamed? Would you be ashamed of the things you wrote, the things you said, the, the way you've talked about people, the conversations you had, the things you subscribe to, the things you partake in, as we see these books unravel, it tells us not the person that you present, but the person that you actually are. And what John is saying here is that is not a hypothetical. That book exists. 
And for some of you, that is a hard reminder because you've done a great job at hiding things. You put the work in of hiding wrongs, selfish actions, intentions, conversations, things you've buried in the past that you just want to take to the grave with you because it would hurt potentially your family relationships, strain even a marriage, that your reputation at work would be tainted, and you've done everything you can to bury these things, to hide them, to frame them differently. And John here provides a very kind truth to all of us to have stuffed it all down, paying the emotional toll of keeping it down, it's actually impossible to hide it. You have believed a lie that will stay with you forever. Your life will be proclaimed. So instead of having it ruin your life, share, confess, own, heal, from the things that you've buried, that you put away, that you've made a secret. Like some of you need to share something with your spouse after this service. Some of you need to go back to that coworker and say, that's not exactly how it went down that day. Teenagers, you are smarter than your parents. You can hide things better than them. They think they know what's on your phone. They probably actually don't. Look, if the end goal is that you deceived and you tricked your parents in five years from now, you can look back at the cost of any depth and relationship and transparency, like, I guess you win. I think the hope is that you'd have a meaningful relationship with your parents, potentially taking that thing from under your bed, bringing it to them, showing them the thing on your screen, bringing transparency into your life. Some of you just need to simply stop fooling yourself that you're hiding things from God. Well, Augustine says, I'm in failing to confess, Lord, I would only hide you from myself, not myself from you. Only you miss out in trying to keep things hidden from God. Things that are already recorded. And for some of you, this isn't a daunting feeling. This is actually a life-giving, gentle reminder. It is sweetness to it that there will be a day when everything will be proclaimed, revealed for those who have stories that have not been heard, injustice that's happened to you that no one has heard about, where no one believed you, took your side. All of that comes to the surface. All the bribes, the family cover-ups, the false accusations, the hidden truths, everything twisted becomes undone at the feet of the throne. It's all written down exactly as it was. And there's almost even a sense of healing in that here and now in this moment knowing that there is a place where truth is recorded for all to hear one day. And if we were to look at this book, we would recognize, all of us, that we are perpetrators and victims. There are things on that list that we have done to people and things on that list that people have done to us. The book's sum total tells us the inescapable truth that we are all sinners. And if we were to find our name, the book would be larger than we'd be comfortable with. It'd be too much to bear to read every page, every part of that list. And it's so on the nose, every intention, attitude, action, deed, that there's no wiggle room to deflect, to blame somewhere else, to justify. It's all just there for us to embrace. It'd be too much for anyone to bear. That book exists now. It's not some mythical idea. It's not some... Spiritual, it's more in reality than the books you have read in this lifetime. And that day will come. That day is more real than the day that we are living right now, tomorrow, and even the, your own birthday. It's not a concept. It is coming. But thank God there's a second book. As the text continues, it says another book was opened, the book of life. Well, Revelation 13 gives a longer name. It says the book of life of the lamb who was slain. That literally we can read this documents. We can read the books written about us. And it doesn't give us this sense of despair, but gratitude. The list goes on and on. There's just greater gratitude knowing the lamb was slain on our behalf, paying the full measure of the library books against us. That he made us something new 
that he gave us, as Revelation says, right robes. And he's actually positioned us as righteous. He's put us in the book of the Lamb, the book of life. This is a beautiful exchange. The cross of what he did 2,000 years ago has an impact for us now and in the future that our names are written in that book, paying the full measure of it all, giving us his righteousness. We are not in that book because we deserve it. We are in that book because God, it is a landish love for us, is grace for sinners. He extends mercy and forgiveness for all those who would receive. It's this beautiful, free gift. And man, as we're kind of closing this series, and this book kind of provokes a question and an answer, it kind of pushes you in a corner a little bit. And for those who just feel like, I don't know, I haven't made a decision to follow Jesus. I got dragged here by my wife or my mom or whatever or my friend. I want to I plea with you. I want to challenge you to consider Jesus in this moment, to not put it off. There is a day where it all comes to an end. That even now the invitation is the same. His forgiveness is for you. Whatever you've done, how much you've done of it, how bad it is, it is all paid for on the cross and the invitation is extended that you can have Jesus in your life. If life is not working for you, if you feel like it's leaving you down a dead end, he is available to you now in this moment. And all you need to do is respond. All you need to do is invite him into your life. Recognize your need for a Savior. Recognize you are in a sinking city of Babylon that is not going your way. And there is something better, richer, truer available for you. And all you have to do is respond. Repenting, accepting that you are a sinner and you are in desperate need of a Savior. And asking him to forgive you and to follow his ways, to make him Lord of your life that he has life and life abundant set out for you, personal purpose laid out for you. That is available to you now. So if that's you, I want to challenge you. We have going to have prayer teams on my left, my right, at different sites. We have prayer teams in the lobby. Some of you know where to connect. You can chat with a pastor. Please chat with someone. Connect with someone. Get prayer. Have that conversation with us. We'd love to get to know you. Let's pray. Father, This book is an intense book. There's a lot of imagery here that is tough, that is hard. But today what we can recognize, be reminded of, is Babylon, as powerful as it looks, as we look at the media, as we look at politics, as we look at things out in culture, as we look at songs, as we look at the arts, Babylon is sinking. And whether we're pre, post, amillennialism, What matters most in this passage is you are coming. You're coming back. So, Lord, we want to just live our lives with what we have in our hands. We want to be a church that recognizes there's potency in what you've given us, the gospel. Lord, let us not fall asleep. Let a culture just lull us to sleep, but be provoked to action to live a life on mission, to be a church on mission, that we would see dozens of baptisms. Lord, we'd see even more next time, next time, because we are all participating in what you are doing. So help us. Give us courage to share. Give us grace. Give us wisdom to know when. We want to be used by you, recognizing you are already on the throne. grateful. We're grateful for the work of the cross. We're grateful for the impact it has. We're grateful for this reminder once again. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for our online service, and we really hope that this was an impactful time for you. I know for myself, I felt so challenged as Pastor Victor reminded us that in the midst of darkness, in the midst of the horrible things that we see in the world around us, in the midst of Babylon, 
that we have to remember the power that we wield in our hands, and that is the power of the gospel, that Jesus is victorious over Satan, sin, and death. And with that in mind, God's calling each and every one of us to participate in his rescue mission for the world. At Village Church, we wanna invite you to participate in the mission of what we're doing here. And one of the best ways for you to do that is by joining us at one of our live sites. What I wanna encourage you to do is go to our website, see if there's a live site near you, because we don't want you to just observe, but we want you to actually participate in seeing people transformed into fully devoted followers of Jesus. Thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time.